power, influence, prestige. <laughs> Concepts that have benefited us and plagued us, they both give and take. They are a double-edged sword. They say that once you achieve these ideals, you change for the worse. But you could also say that it's in the chase of these ideals where the change really happens. Many people do things that they thought they would never do in order to reach power and prestige. We then rightfully criticize them when they do reach it. But what if you just so happen upon power by pure luck? Do we criticize them then? Are they still deserving of criticism? That, to me, is what the story of Echo Knight is all about. At least that's the overarching theme that I got from it. If that interests you, or you're a Dark Souls fan, keep watching, because this is a From Software game. Echo Knight is an adventure slash survival horror game released in the late 90s for the PlayStation 1, developed by From Software, long before this beautiful man came along and changed the whole company image. I have to commend the marketing team for this game for the box art. In a time of early CG and constipated 3D men, they chose to have a unique font with an obscure chip behind it. It's not only interesting and unique, but it also fits with the game and the experience that you'll have. You play as Richard Osmond, age 25. You have a pedometer, which measures if there's any pedos around. You get a call from the Anchor Police Department about your father, Henry Osmond, whose house burned down and he disappeared without leaving a trace. The police officer takes you to your dad's burnt house so you can look around, but tells you not to touch too much because they're still investigating. So he took you to an active crime scene full of sensitive evidence. After solving a quick puzzle, you find your dad's diary and are warped. into a train 38 years in the past, in 1899. On the train, you meet a younger version of your dad, who is chasing this man, William Rockwell, who's possessed by a redstone in this knife. They have an epic duel, and your dad loses. But he's still alive. And he has the blue stone, which counteracts the effects of the redstone. But the blue stone broke in two when he got shot, so he gives one half to William's granddaughter, Kreia. Your dad then does some exposition and jumps off the train. What the fuck? You're then brought back to your father's house where you find a painting of the ship Orpheus, a ship that mysteriously disappeared in 1913. And this is where the game really starts. If you're anything like me, which you should be, you love PS1 graphics. How could you not? They're so charming, yet they are perfect for the horror genre, which is why so many indie horror games try their hardest to imitate this look. Honestly, Echo Knight might be one of my favorite PS1 looks. All the environments are so charming, and even with the dated look, they feel completely realized. Like, all these places could actually exist, but we're just looking at them through this PS1 lens. Also, there's so much variety to the environments. Throughout the game, you are taken through so many different interiors, all with their unique textures, models, and atmosphere. And in all of these different places, there's always objects you can interact with in some way. It's a cool detail, even if they don't really do anything most of the time. Epic. Overall, I think the visuals have aged beautifully. It was always a pleasure to discover what the game will show you next. So, while on the ship, there are hostile ghosts that will attack you. You find some curing potions that you can use to heal yourself. And in my opinion, they give you too much of it, which takes some challenge away from the game. In order to explore a room without the presence of a ghost that can damage you, you have to turn on the lights using the light switch, which makes for some pretty tense moments as you're running towards the nearest light switch as fast as you can. Even more panic inducing is when the lights in the room don't work and you have to make your way back. These moments however are pretty rare. The bulk of what you'll be doing throughout the game is helping the friendly ghost of the ship by either solving puzzles or going into their memories to bring them some sort of closure. One puzzle in particular I thought was pretty cool. So, 
in this game, there's a kind of pseudo physics system. You can pick up some objects and place them somewhere else pretty freely. And you don't place them in like a grid or anything. Anyway, here's the puzzle. You enter this room and this girl tells you that her twin sister is in the opposite room. As you leave the room, you see that the door on the opposite room also closes. This is because the rooms are mirrored. When you enter that other room, the twin sister tells you to leave because there's an evil ghost that comes out of the bathroom. <laughs> okay. So what you do to solve this puzzle is you grab the radiator in the room that is safe and block the bathroom door with it. Now the ghost in the other room can exit the bathroom. This was so awesome to see. It's kind of like a physics puzzle before physics were really in games. Unfortunately, as far as I know, this is really the only instance where they really use this system. I mean, there's this puzzle at the beginning where you have to copy the image in this painting to make the painting of the ship appear. But that's just the first puzzle to tell you that you can in fact move objects around. I don't know, I guess there's two puzzles where they use it, which is fine, I just wish they used it more, because it's such a cool mechanic that you just wouldn't expect to see on the PS1. Speaking of things you wouldn't expect to see, this game has a day and night cycle, like an actual day and night cycle. The time doesn't change when you reach a certain level, it actually has an internal clock and it's actually safer to go outside during the daytime because the ghosts don't like the light. By the way, there's there's a casino level, I don't, I don't really know why. It, it's pretty fun. I mean, I like gambling. Can I bet my wife? But I just think it's weird that you have a level that requires luck to progress. Well, it's not mandatory, but you have to do it if you want the true ending of the game. I think my favorite part of the game is the soundtrack. You have soft, delicate piano melodies, booming intense bass for chases, and cool guitar midi. But I think the best part is that the game isn't afraid of being silent, leaving you alone with the environment and inside your own head. Just the theme of the game alone manages to conjure up so much emotion. Just hearing it makes your mind wander into a beautiful and tragic tale of your own. And as beautiful as it is, it's got an air of mystery that fits into what you'll be doing throughout the game. Something I wasn't expecting was the game to have voice acting this good, especially if you compare it to other horror games of the time. This is really impressive. I locked the door, but she'll still come. So let's talk about this redstone. The redstone has been around for many, many centuries. At one point, we go back in time to see that this medieval king was in possession of the redstone. And this assassin that is going to kill him says, I know your secret. I know how you rose from a common soldier to the king that you are. Clearly, the redstone enhances your lust for power, and in some way, makes sure that you get it. We then find out that this assassin is Alan Rockwell, most likely a late ancestor of William Rockwell, which explains how the Rockwell family is so powerful. I mean, if a common soldier managed to become king, something reserved to very few of a specific bloodline, a very beautiful and pure bloodline, then it can do anything. And the blue stone, well, that just stops the redstone. As you reach the end of the game, you find William Rockwell dying and without the redstone. And as he's dying, he seems to have a moment of clarity, remembering all the people that he killed, and he doesn't even remember why he was doing it. With these hands, I have taken the lives of many innocent people. And what was it that I tried to achieve? Further into the ship, you meet your father, he admits he killed William and says that all along he was looking for this power of the redstone. In order to alleviate the power of the redstone and stop this quirked up white boy from busting it down, sexual style, I'm a quirked up white boy who's busting it down, sexual style. You have to turn on the power, combine the bluestone with the redstone and leave the ship in time before it disappears. Speaking of the bluestone, you get one half of that fucking little thing from this medium guy. When you help out someone on the ship, they drop these astral pieces and you deliver them to him. This guy's pretty weird and there's not much context to him, but I'll talk about him more later. Now, this game has multiple endings. I'll tell you them and leave the best ending for last. Number one, you don't help everyone on the ship and escape the ship in time before it disappears. But when you come back and go to leave your dad's burnt home, you find William's redstone knife in the trunk of the cop car. So the evil of the redstone still lingers on. Number two, you help everyone and give all the little astral balls to the medium guy. When you're escaping the ship, he calls to you and gives you the redstone knife. When you get back to the present, you stab the police officer in the back. You have now become William Rockwell. Number three, 
And finally, the true ending. When the medium offers you the red stone knife, you refuse it. By refusing the temptation of the stone's power to change destiny, you eliminate the stone from the world entirely, ending all possibility of someone else being possessed by its power. I thought this story was pretty cool. I mean, it's super simple. Blue stone good. Red stone bad. But I feel like it's full of metaphoric value. We fantasize, romanticize power, wealth, influence. But at the very end, we realize how unimportant these things are. Unfortunately, we realize it far too late. And before we know it, we have already infected others with this hungry parasite. William Rockwell had the red stone passed to him, whether he wanted to or not. The stone has been a family heirloom for so many generations that it had become something much bigger than himself. The worst part is how easy it is to negate the stone's power. You just have to reject its existence. And for whatever reason, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. But I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into this.